Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. This is a show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre, and tries to find an answer. Tries, doesn't always succeed. <laughs> always tries. Um, how you doing today, Caroline? Uh, fine, I guess. Um, it was a very lovely day today. It Beautiful. was uh, nicely cool. We see the, the cool fall weather coming in, and uh, unfortunately, the, the longer nights have begun as well. Yeah, so all of you with seasonal affective depression out there, we are on sad watch. <laughs> all of you with sad what up. <laughs> um, I've got a great story for you this week. I'm so excited. This is a story of murder from an unlikely place. Because this week we're going to be talking about Dr. John Dale Cavaness. I don't think I've heard of him. Cavaness uh, was a respected, prominent local physician. Uh, as of 1984, he was kind of a pillar of his community, uh, well-liked by everyone, often known for waiving fees for patients who were unable to pay, an old-school healer who would still make house calls, um, exactly the kind of guy who older folks complain isn't around anymore. Mm -hmm. Your old friend... Dr. John Cavaness. Is he not around anymore because he's in prison? No, but we'll get to why <laughs> in a little bit. Cavaness was headed to prison because he was convicted in 1984 of murdering his son, Sean, oh. then 22 years old. Um, there was a ton of community outrage because of this like well-respected member of the, the town being uh, accused of such a grisly crime. But in fact... Dr. Cavaness showed his family a very different side than the public, and in fact had most likely killed his other son in 1977. Oh dear. When he was then also 22 years old. The other son. Yeah. So this guy was like, you ain't making it to 23 in my family, baby. Well, four sons. Only two of them died at age 22, so... That's a pretty bad set of odds, It's though. definitely a bad <laughs> record, like, as a parent. Yeah. Our main source for this story, uh, this twisted tale, is the is the book Murder in Little Egypt by Darcy O'Brien. Uh, O'Brien is a true crime. I think he writes some fiction, too, but he's best known for the book Two of a Kind, which is about the Hillside Stranglers. Mm. Uh, so we might turn back. I think that's the best known book on the Hillside Stranglers, actually. So we might turn back to Darcy O'Brien when we get to that case. Mm-hmm. I really know absolutely nothing about this. Uh, I, I know like a vague uh, amount about the Hillside Stranglers. Uh, I, I've never heard of this guy, never heard of this case. So audience, I'm going to be uh, going along with you on this strange journey. So the subtitle on the book, Murder in Little Egypt, is The True Story of a Filicide, a crime so shocking that its name is rarely heard. Wow. And in fact, uh, true to Darcy O'Brien's word, I had to learn the word, I mean, you can infer the meaning from the cover there, right? But I didn't know the word filicide before. Uh, that is the killing of one's son. It's probably for the best. It's something that you don't hear about very often because so often we, I think we see our children as reflections of ourselves, extensions of ourselves. It goes against every instinct in your body to kill the the people that you brought into this world who for many parents are their reason for living after the child's birth sure i mean it, it is definitely an instinctual thing even back from caveman times of um wanting to protect your kids because we want a human race to keep going so yeah not super usual but unfortunately there's plenty of stories of parents doing terrible things to kids abusing them Things like that. Now, Little Egypt, I also had never heard of. That's apparently the name given by locals to the southern part of Illinois. Are there a lot of Egyptian so, I no. immigrants? No, there's a lot of like Scots-Irish and um, Anglo-Saxons, just like the rest of Illinois. Um, well, so the rest of southern <laughs> Illinois. So it's not like Little Italy. No, it's uh, what it is is an upside-down triangle that's penned in by the uh, Wabash, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. And it's bordered by Kentucky to the south and uh, a line kind of drawn across from St. Louis to the north. That's what you would consider Egypt. So why is it called that? Because I can't think of anything 
further away from Egypt. Well, it's weird. Well, first of all, this region does lay at the delta of a few different rivers. And of course, Egypt was was built at the delta of the Nile, Mm -hmm. which is why it was the only place in Africa people could like grow grain (laughs) at the time. And so you do have a river delta here. What you don't have is that very uh, rich soil that that implies. Actually, the soil is a little thinner and worse for growing in Egypt than in the rest of Indiana. Mm -hmm. But in the horrible winter of 1831 to 32, farmers from up north in the state were coming south to buy corn and seed after all their crops had died and talked about themselves as being like the sons of Jacob going, quote, down to Egypt to buy corn. That's from Genesis 42, of course, Karen. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, whatever whatever gets you going. Um, the city of Cairo, fi- coming out of that name, uh, so people started calling it Egypt in 1831, and then the city of Cairo was founded right at the River Delta in 1837. Soon to follow were Karnak, Thebes, and other biblical names like Palestine, Lebanon, and even Herod and Sodom, which... Uh, closed up at the uh, beginning part of last century. Yeah, I mean, no one wants to say I live in Sodom. <laughs> um, no, there is a Sodom, there's at least like a Sodom lane up in Ansonia. I know that. There's a cemetery on it. Well, it's a very interesting place. The heart of Egypt is the towns of El Dorado. That's spelled like El Dorado, but I am assured that it is pronounced El Dorado. El Dorado. El Dorado and Harrisburg are called Little Egypt, and they're kind of the most Egypty part of Egypt. <laughs> sure. These are coal towns. Certainly, El Dorado is a coal town. It's a tiny, out of uh, out of the way place. Out of state license plates get stares as you're driving down the street. It's a super white town. Uh, it was mostly Anglo-Saxon and Scotch-Irish, but got a little bit of Czech and Polish and Italian uh, during the 1900s when the coal boom was happening. Uh, this is a deeply southern town. Hmm. Harrisburg next door has a little bit more money in that it actually has stores and restaurants and more than like a couple of streets. Um, as of 1989, when this book was written, you could still get a two-gun Smith & Weston pistol set at the bank there when you uh, purchased a special deposit certificate. Can't imagine that's still going on. Uh, I don't know. I, I couldn't find any record <laughs> of that promotion still going on. I don't even know if that bank is still open. Hmm. But it does go along with what O'Brien characterizes as kind of a a frontier spirit bordering on violent spirit. Um, this part of the country has a murder rate of 10.1 per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, the rest of the country in 1989 had a 6.6. We're about 6.5 now. So, uh, not quite double. But enough. But enough. (laughs) Um, and if I can quote O'Brien here, because I like the way he, I love a true crime novel with a good sense of place and time. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those that really sketches it out before they even get into the story. So, O'Brien says... Many Egyptian murders have a special local flavor to them, as with the wife who shot her husband to death, cut him up, and fed him to the hogs, or the 30-year-old son who loved his mother so much that he laced his daddy's iced tea with antifreeze. Bar fights ending in shootouts take their toll. This violence has been an unbroken tradition for nearly 200 years. Well, isn't that sweet? Uh, The region was dominated by mob violence in the 20s, when Charlie Berger, the bootlegger, ran Little Egypt and uh, constantly was beating back the rival Shelton brothers with Tommy guns. And before that, it was more or less run by the Klan, who um, there were no black people in Southern... Oh, no. There were... An out-of-state license plate gets looked at. I mean, oof. There are not now many black people, I don't think, in Southern Illinois. There were basically none in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, so what the Klan had to rally against then was uh, it was all about temperance. They were against drinking. So they murdered about uh, fi- at least 50 Italians and Irishmen in uh, about f- two years. Man, we would have been screwed. Well, you're not a big drinker. I'm Italian. <laughs> I'm married to an Irishman. You are that. Um, these guys suck in every possible way. Um, yeah, and... Just so, no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Yeah, you can't grow much food here. The people love oh, I'm to just murder. Talk, I'm talking about the clan. Oh. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, the clan. I'm not lumping everyone in southern India or Illinois into a, one shitty group, but I'm going to do that with the clan. I think I could take that. Yeah, the clan's not big on like 
recommendable qualities. No. Yeah. Anywho. <laughs> As you can see, it's a tough region to grow food in. It's a economically not super booming region. Uh, it is a very small place where uh, new people find a hard time finding a welcome. And so it hasn't grown too much. In fact, uh, over the generations, children tended to uh, leave and find higher paying work elsewhere. And in 1984, Little Egypt had roughly the same population it did in 1934. Hmm. Huh. Into this tableau was born John Dale Cavaness, the man who would one day become the local doctor. They should have known, giving him three names, he was destined to be a killer. <laughs> well, his mom named him John, but he always went by Dale. Now, I don't know if it was just because it sounds more like more of a shit kicker name. I'm sorry if anyone named Dale is listening to this. I know some Dales who I love, but it sounds, you know, it's more for the country than John is. Hmm. John's mother said that he was breech birth. Sorry, Dale's mother, because that is what he insisted on. Dale's mother said he was breech birth, and he's been doing things the hard way ever since. For his part, his father was a hard-nosed roughneck working on the uh, railroad and in the coal mines, and he uh, raised his son to work hard, and to work hard basically all of the time at whatever he did. Cavaness saw his family and friends deeply affected by the Great Depression, and uh, he was talking about becoming a doctor by the time he was eight years old in 1933, because he thought that would bring uh, fame. Well, not he thought that would bring fortune to the to the family and uh, to his children, who he didn't want ever to have to go through something like uh, like he saw his family go through. It's a big aspiration for a rail worker's son in the 30s, who's for sure. eight years old. Yeah, uh, but I don't want to make it sound like the family was destitute. They actually did, compared to their neighbors, pretty well. Uh, they had work. Yeah, and there was there was never a question that John was going to get to go to college, for example, mm. which wasn't a guarantee for all families in the 20s, much less the 30s after everything crashed. Mm -hmm. John was a star in high school basketball, track, and football. That work ethic his father had uh, lectured and occasionally beaten into him, uh, paying dividends throughout <laughs> all the games and track meets. He would called out in the local paper for his touchdown passes that he caught and uh, all that kind of thing, lettered in all these uh, sports. And after graduation, it was time for the Navy because World War II was raging. Mm. So he spent two years in the Navy where he actually saw action in the Pacific. He was an ensign aboard the North Carolina. And uh, I looked up the North Carolina's record. He probably got aboard after they came in for repairs in 43, which would have put... John Dale Cavanus, right in the middle of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which was called by American pilots later the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, mm. because of the incredibly mismatched, like, death toll. Um, the, the Americans were just shooting Japanese planes out of the sky, you know, like turkeys, they said. Wow. The Japanese lost two fleet carriers and one light carrier in that battle, like a blow they would never recover from as a Navy, and more than 550 planes and their pilots uh, the Americans lost just under 80 planes. Jesus. No boats. 550 planes. My God. Turkey shoot. Nightmare. So that was the kind of, that's likely the only place Dale saw action in, in the Pacific was uh, during that battle aboard that ship. Uh, he would have seen lots of death, but danger might not have been all, all that close. Mm-hmm. And probably more death on the other side, which you can kind of reason away a little more. Almost exclusively. No, like, I I don't think that Carolina or any of the other battleships were ever really in danger of sinking in this battle. Mm -hmm. When he got home, Dale married, his high Dale married his high school sweetheart, Helen Jean, and um, went right into college. They actually eloped because his parents wanted him to finish college before he got married. Mm-hmm. So uh, they went over the state border into Arkansas and got married as, uh, as I don't know, it, did you used to need permission if you were under 21 to get married? That sounds like a stretch. Because it said they were both underage in this book, but he had been in the Navy for two years, so I don't think he graduated high school at 16. When did the draft, like, were you, did you have to be 18 to be drafted, or was it 16? I don't But then he no, still would he, have been he graduated high school. of age. That's so weird, I don't know. So I feel like you might have needed your parents' permission in this state until it was 
until you were 21 or something? That sounds a little dramatic. Anyhow, they got married. Screw it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, he graduated from the University of Illinois, cum laude, in May 1947, and started into medical school at Washington University in St. Louis. Mixed reviews from his classmates, by the way. About him? Yeah. Dale, uh, there were people who didn't... I mean, I guess there's people who don't like everybody, right? Except for you. What? Everybody likes you. Oops. That's patently false. People who didn't like Dale said he was kind of a know-it-all, obnoxious, uh, always telling other people they were wrong, very um, aggressive with his opinion, mm. and aggressive in general. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, people who liked him found it liked his uh, country manners and his folksy accent, and his uh, he was friendly, kind of good old boy, always wanted to party. And he was elected president of his fraternity. That's much more of a social thing than an academic thing. So um, he was well liked, I guess is my point. Sure. I mean, you have to be to be president of a fraternity, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's purely social. Uh, it was around this time when he was still in medical school, he was abandoned by that first wife, Helen Jean. Oh. Yeah. They'd gotten very close with another couple who they were friends with. They would play bridge and stuff. <gasps> a scandal. Yeah, and she left him for the guy in that couple. So then you marry the wife in the couple. He didn't do that, but he did start asking her friend Marion out like two weeks later. That's fair enough. Um, Dale called her Maria, and the two were married uh, before too long, actually. This was a, a kind of a whirlwind romance, it seems. Uh, she was a And divorce, apparently. Oh, no. Uh... Oh, yeah. Hel yes. Helen Jean, that divorce was taken care of very quickly. Dale was embarrassed by the whole thing. As Sure, and I'm sure his his parents were like, we told you so, and that's always terrible. Mm-hmm. This doesn't seem like a guy who liked to admit he was wrong. Correct. Absolutely correct. Now with the new wife, Marion, Dale moved around the country for a couple of years, serving as a resident in a few different hospitals. Uh, and Marion was a flight attendant, actually, so she was kind of based in a few different cities over this span. It sounds like it worked out pretty well. Yeah. They didn't see each other all the time, right? But um, Marion said during this time, she always just kind of figured in the back of her head, assumed, you know, Dale's working in these city hospitals. Eventually, he'll finish med school, settle down in one of these city hospitals, and we will, you know, have a life in whatever, Denver... Um, Baton Rouge, uh, <laughs> probably not Baton Rouge, uh, New York, Boston, mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Uh, and then Dale promptly announced in 1954 that the couple would be moving to Southern Illinois that September. Did he get a job at a hospital there? Yes, he had already been, accepted a position at a hospital that he hadn't told Marion about. <laughs> and it was, it's kind of the, at the one hospital in Little Egypt, it was kind of the head of hospital role. You know, you're the guy who delivers the babies, you make the house calls, you're the local doctor. Yeah, I mean, I guess he preferred being a big fish in a small pond. But Sean, if that ever happens, and, and you just accept a job, don't do that. Uh, let's talk about it first. But that makes it to say he just accepted the job makes it sound like he wasn't angling for it the whole time. He definitely did apply for it and seek it out. And also, Marion said she realized just a little bit later, well, if he was specializing this whole time in general medicine with kind of like a minor in gynecology, uh, I think this was always his ending spot. Well, he would know the ending spot being a minor in gynecology. <laughs> <laughs> well, because if as a, uh, but as the local doctor, you have to deliver babies. So he he this was his plan the whole time. Interesting. He just never bothered to tell Marion. Hmm. Because she was an accessory to the uh, to the life. Yuck. Now, I've told you all about Little Egypt. I don't think I need to tell you that Marion from St. Louis didn't... It took her a little while to take to Little Egypt. Sure. In fact, she didn't like it at all. Sure. Uh, incredibly boring. The people didn't like her. No one was friendly. She's a city girl. There's no restaurants or stores here. What are we doing? Mm. On their first wedding anniversary, the couple was getting a little bit tipsy, had just cracked open their third bottle of wine, and Marion giggled and said, I mean, I can't see us staying here forever, can you? I mean, it is sort of the ends of the earth. 
There was a pause. And he said... She said she saw... He didn't say anything. She said she saw him loom into the side of her vision, and then his fist crashed into her face. Oh, my God. And this was the first time? Yeah. First anniversary. And she had... She ran into the bathroom. Oh, yeah. That's the punching anniversary, right? (laughs) Yes. In the second one's paper. Oh, God. She ran to the bathroom, locked the door, you know, panic kind of thing. Uh, Expects him to follow. He didn't. She heard the glasses clink in the next room a few times, and then after she said what seemed like an hour, he went into the bedroom, and then she went and slept in the spare bedroom. (sighs) Horrible. He didn't mention anything about it the next day, and when she asked him about it, he said he remembered nothing and and to forget about it. She had a big old bruise on the side of her face. God. This was the start of a pattern that started growing immediately. And as Dale started drinking more and more, the abuse got worse, as often happens. Why was he so determined to work in this small town? To the point where he felt like he had to defend it with his fist. I don't think that he was really defending the town with his fist. I think he's defending... His choice, or like, I'm the man, I make the rules. Yeah, you don't get to talk to me like that. I decided that we're here. Ugh. And I think that you're going to see a pattern with his, the way he treats his wife and his kids and everyone else in the world, <laughs> human or otherwise, to, to John Dale Cavaness, I think they're really just accessories or window dressing to whatever it is he's trying to do and whatever it is he's entitled to. I think there's a lot of entitlement to this. He decided he's going to be the doctor in Little Egypt when he was eight years old and... uh that's so he's, what's going to happen. He's also a narcissist. No one really exists except for him. No one else's choices matter because he's the king of the world. As we get in, yes, certainly a narcissist and maybe a full-blown sociopath. We'll we'll see as we get on. But D- Dale's certainly got some personality disorders, yeah. Mm. He also was pretty even at this point in his life, pretty casual about death. Now keep in mind he's a doctor. He's just finished his residency he's seen a lot of death in hospitals uh, marion said when she would come with him on calls sometimes house calls because he liked the company or because he liked showing off that he had a wife i guess mm-hmm. um she would have to like leave the room while he was you know tending to someone who was literally dying uh and she said dale was never affected by that stuff whatsoever and she like en- envied him for it you know um he also served in in the war who knows how much he saw there but um this is a man who's become obviously somewhat calloused to death well i don't think that's necessarily a warning sign right off the bat i mean some people are just better at handling this stuff get more used to it like a funeral director a mortician local news reporter uh if you say so (laughs) um I don't think, I, I don't want it to sound like that's just a warning sign, you know, no matter what. Um, right. But it is. It's concerning with his prior actions. It's an interesting aspect of Dale's personality here. Mm-hmm. And it probably informed his love of hunting. Mm. Uh, Dale didn't like hanging out with his wife very much. The old ball and chain. <sighs> um, I hate. Mm, that makes me so mad. I know. But uh, Dale was definitely that guy. He liked uh, hanging out with his buddies. He liked going out drinking. He liked playing poker. uh, And he loved hunting. Uh, So one time, a friend with a private plane. Land is really (laughs) cheap in Illinois. So, you know, you you don't have to be a bazillionaire to have a a couple of farms and a private plane if you live in Illinois in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So a buddy with a plane flew them out to go pheasant hunting. And while they were out for the weekend, uh, they were walking one of the days, and a snowy owl was flying overhead. You're not supposed to shoot snowy owls. You're not supposed to shoot owls in general when you're hunting. They were out pheasant hunting. No, they're sweet. They're not only beautiful, they're a legally protected animal. Yes, they should be. Migratory Bird Act. Um, And the guide said, oh, that's an owl, don't shoot. And Dale took aim and shot the owl. Aww. The owl fell, but didn't die immediately. And Dale walked up and said, the quote uh, from the book is, Shit, no, I want that son of a bitch on my wall. No, Hedwig. So he wouldn't let them put the bird out of its misery. And instead stuffed it, still twitching, into a game bag. (sighs) The bird was still alive when they got to the guide's house. And uh, Dale said something to the effect of, Oh, doesn't that beat all? 
Uh, well, here we go. Uh, this will do it. And then he stuck it in a plastic bag and, st- and into the freezer. Oh. Just the, just the most horrible thing you could do. Then the boys went out for beers. And then they get a call from the guide's wife. The thing had, she said, the cold must have revived it. Of uh, The freezer, it was alive in the freezer and pecking at the hamburger meat she had in there. Let it go, lady. That's what the guide said. The guide said the words, maybe this guy got himself a stay of execution. What do you think? And Dale, oh, I'm sure Dale was like, you know what? Yeah. Dale was already grabbing the owl by its legs, going outside and bashing its head against the stairs. He did mount it on his wall. Is that supposed to, like, make me feel better? <laughs> Fuck. Ugh, okay. So you've got this gem of a husband. Why don't we, why don't we bring children into the world? Oh, no. And the, the Cavaness's first son, Mark, was delivered by Dale himself, the local doctor, on August 13th. Great. Marion had hoped that a little more warmth might come into the house when there was a baby around. Um, but she says Dale wasn't really interested, except to occasionally look up from his paper or his vodka and bark out that she should stop picking the baby up every time he cried. <sighs> but he was well-liked in the community. Well, yeah, so let's talk about Dr. Dale. Um, like I said, he would. his assistant says she had to basically force him to settle open accounts and bills every year. He would always say, like, oh, people can't, af- if people can't afford it, I'm here to help. That's and so fascinating. Yeah, and he would, when she finally made him go through them, he would, uh, she would go, no, you can't, as he, like, crumpled up many bills that he knew people couldn't pay and threw them into the trash. I get putting on a face of, like, you're a great guy or whatever, but this is something you don't necessarily have to do. You don't have to throw away people's bills to still be, like, the beloved local doctor. And it doesn't seem like something that fits in with a a narcissism. So I I just don't understand it. Well, it does fit with narcissism if he thinks of himself as the great old school local doctor who still makes house calls and everybody can count on. If that's part of his self-image. Yeah, but, you know, if someone's kind of screwing you over by not paying you for your services, that seems like it goes against narcissism. What, my services aren't good enough for you to pay? Or you should be able to figure something out. I think we're talking about people who literally... No, I I get that. But (sighs) any kind of empathy or sympathy doesn't seem to to fit in with the rest of this guy. Yeah, people would... He would let people stay in the hospital just until they died, whether they could pay the room bills or not. Because, um, you know, he he said to the assistant one time something like, look, she can't pay the bills. She's going to die in 12 days. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, Dr. Dale was also well-liked by most of his employees and patients for being a real jokester at work. Oh, yeah, that's always something you like in a surgeon. Who doesn't love a jokey doctor. Um, yeah, how about some examples of these? So he would, um, he loved subbing out x-rays. That was a fun bit he would do. Hmm. Like he would show you an x-ray he had taken, you know, months or years before from somebody who had cancer or like a broken limb and go like, well, the good news is your odds are at least 50-50. Shit, that might be better than the baseball team this year. And watch the like color drain out of their face and then just go, (laughs) you know, like, "Ah, I gotcha. So he'd troll people by telling them they had cancer? Yeah, or like a broke, you know, That's if they fail, he'd be like, yeah, it's bro- it's broke real bad. Look at oh that. Oh, my God. This may I never recover. I hate this guy. This guy sucks. He once told Marilyn, this assistant we're talking about, um, hey, that uh, patient in there, could you just uh, go up and uh, just get real close, check his eyes. I need to see if his pupils are dilated. So Marilyn goes in there, and she comes out, and she was like, no, his pupils aren't dilated, and the doctor's already doubled over laughing. He's going, yeah, the guy's got mumps. You see how close you got to him? <laughs> Jesus. Now, for a 30-year-old woman who had never had mumps as a child, uh, it would have been a serious and hideously painful yeah. infection. Uh, not at all. Not at all funny if she had if she had gotten it. And she said she was panicked about Literally the putting people in harm's way. He's a jokester. <laughs> yeah, he's a real Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, he would do these fun little jokes at home, too, like... Uh, like Marian, punching his wife. Like punching his wife! Or one time, she was in the... Uh, Near Christmas, it was it was actually, I think, Christmas Eve, she had hidden the presents upstairs in the attic like you do. So he told her to go get the presents, and then as soon as she went into the attic, he locked the trap door behind her. 
And there's no lights in there, so she was stuck in the dark while he went and made himself a drink. That's it. That's the joke. That's a fun joke. Right, like, this guy's bad, right? It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a scary situation to live in. Yeah. And we haven't even gotten started. Uh, like I said, not much interest in the family rituals for Dr. Dale. He was more into hanging out with the bros. So he would kind of, he would, oh, every time he was made to uh, take photographs with the family or spend time with his kids. Um, liked playing golf, again, poker, always with male buddies, and uh, especially liked hunting. Uh, Dr. Dale still woke up and did 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups every morning and still had to win at goddamn everything, just like when he was in high school. Mm-hmm. Kevin, uh, one of O'Brien, one of Darcy O'Brien's main interviews was Kevin, the third son. Mm-hmm. And that's because the first two sons are both dead. Murdered. And, and the fourth son is was too young for all of this to, to really remember it. Well, he was under 22. Kevin... T- <laughs> Oh, I get it. Uh, Kevin told one story where he was 11 years old and Dale was really drunk and they had brought some bulls um, to a show, like a state fair or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the biggest... They had some sort of farm? uh, Several farms. I think Dale had two different farms that he was trying to get to work and they were both losing money. Mm. And Marilyn would uh, occasionally go like, I don't know if you should be buying... Should we be sinking so much money into the farms, Dale? Uh, and he would say things like, well, those good-for-nothing sons of yours will need something to fall back on, like that kind of thing. Um, but again, this was just his vision of himself as like a good old boy farmer slash doctor. Mm-hmm. He needs to have the whole picture. So he's got his prize bulls, and he's going up to the uh, state fair with his 11-year-old son and a bunch of cow hands. And Dale, who was Literally, apparently, always had an open bottle of vodka or whiskey with him if he was in the country. Mm -hmm. If he wasn't, like, in town as a doctor. He always had an open bottle in his hand like he's in fucking Deadwood or something. Jesus. And so he's doing that. He's swigging vodka out out of a glass bottle while they're trying to load the prize bull of the herd onto the onto the truck it weighed like 2000 pounds uh and it was ornery that day but it was apparently worth like thousands of dollars the bull wouldn't go up the ramp and into the truck and dale drunk off of his ass went to the went stomped over to his pickup truck to, came back with his 357 cocked it stuck it in the bull's face and said all right your hamburger and shot it like point blank? Point blank in the head. In the eye, actually. So he's not making any money out of it. They so they had to, well, it took them the rest of the day to now drag the dead bull up that ramp that they were trying to get the live bull to walk up um, so it could be slaughtered and sold for meat. You're making less money off it this way, but... But you're making a point. To the other steer, I guess? <sighs> I don't know. He's a drunk asshole. He don't has, ask me. Okay, your burger. <sighs> so it took them all day, him and the cow hands, to move the corpse of this 2,000 pound animal. The whole time, all of them are drinking beer, and Dale's still swigging out of this bottle. And so by the time they were done, he was staggering drunk and made Kevin, 11 years old, drive him home while he passed out in the passenger seat. Ah, the 60s. This is about the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kevin said, now this is Kevin talking with the knowledge of his two brothers murder in the back of his head, but he says that as an 11-year-old, he white-knuckled the wheel the whole way home, just hoping he wouldn't end up like that bull. Jeez. Meanwhile, at home, obviously Dale was regularly abusing Marion, especially while drinking. The arguments were constant and loud. Uh, Kevin said his favorite person in the entire world at this time was his babysitter. Because when she was around, all the shouting would stop. Because he had to put on the mask. Yeah, exactly. Or she would come in. She was really good. They would be screaming at each other right in front of her. But she was apparently good at going like, oh, hold on. Let me get this cleaned up. Or like, oh, shouldn't we do something about that? She would diffuse. Mm. One time Kevin saw his father grab his mother's thumb and bend it back until it snapped. Oh, God. (laughs) That gave me the shivers. Another time. After Marion made some side comment, Dale grabbed her arm, bent it all the way back until it almost broke behind her, and then socked her in the face twice while he held her there. So this is what he's doing in front of the kids. This guy's a sicko. 
Yeah. Uh, and it was around this time that he probably started cheating on Marion with some lady named Martha. And this was a, this was a real circus. Uh, Marion was driving the kids and a friend through one of Dale's properties. Remember, he has a couple of them around the towns. Um, and they see Dale's car outside. Mm. And Dale's walking outside of his trailer that he keeps on the property with just a surgical smock and nothing else on. Oh, God. Uh, and, like, it's a full, like, she pulls the car up onto the lawn. She's screaming, where's that Sharon? Where's Sharon? Let me at her! And uh, the kids are in the car with their buddy. Their friend started crying and went, I'm so sorry for you guys. <laughs> The kids didn't see their father for weeks after that. And when he came home, he would come home to take a shower in the morning and then leave. Kevin said he never saw him, but he would hear the shower. And uh, Marion would ask, where are you staying? P please just stay. Can we talk? And he would say, leave me alone and walk out again. I mean, those are probably the most peaceful weeks of her life. Just let him go, Marion. Here's the problem for Marion. I don't think Marion has any real useful skills, life skills, money-making skills. No, but ostensibly he's still paying the bills during this time. Yes. At least you're not getting actively punched in the face. That's true. So maybe this was a peaceful time. Um, Dale had at some point started living with Martha. He was eventually open with Marion about this on the few occasions he talked to her, but he uh, told Marion, oh, I'm not sleeping with her, though. We're friends. She's been in a rough period since she got over her divorce, and so I'm just helping her out for a while. Mm -hmm. Then he finally called her for a big talk and took her on a drive, and Marion thought, okay, here we go. He's going to come back. He's going to explain why he's been acting so crazy. And over the course of this long car ride, Dale tells her that he's not in love with her. And that he's go. he wants to leave her, and, oh, sorry that you're six months pregnant. Because this was while Marion was six months pregnant with the couple's fourth child. Oh, boy. That baby was named Patrick. Dale was in the delivery room. Remember, he was the local doctor. Uh, but the entire delivery, he was talking about cattle farming to an old man who had just been released from the hospital. And Marion said when she came out of anesthetic, Dale was there, and he just said, It's another boy. And then he left. So four boys total? Four boys total. So there's Mark. Mark, Sean, Sean Kevin. Kevin, and now Patrick. Patrick. Nice little Irish family. Very, very Irish names. These could be McCabe's. <sighs> yeah. Which makes it all the more tragic. Better not be McCabe's. So this isn't a great guy so far, right? No, Sean. It's not even a good guy. It's not even a middling guy. He's a piece of shit. But he's not yet a murderer. Yeah, there's a lot of terrible people who aren't murderers. And while his sons would still be safe for another few years, we will get to John Dale Cavaness's first homicide after the break. Mm. Do you have what it takes to go into the mind of a serial killer? Or solve a horrific case? <laughs> Hi, everybody. When you join Hunt a Killer, you receive a box full of cryptic clues mailed to you each month to test your detective skills and challenge even the most brilliant minds in a game designed to give you a journey into the mind of a killer so you can escape with the answers you need. And I hope you do escape. Input our code Scary Squad 20 for 20% off when you sign up for your first subscription box at huntakiller.com and find out if you have the guts to hunt a killer. The guts. That's the code Scary Squad 20 S C A R Y S Q U A D 20 for 20% off at huntakiller.com www.huntakiller.com. Hunt a killer. Join the hunt today. Welcome back. When last we left you, Dr. John Dale Cavaness, Dale to his friends, had just uh, rid himself of the old ball and chain, and he was ready to get out there and start living that swinging bachelor doctor lifestyle. 
Honestly, so much the better for Mary. <laughs> yes, he had finally taken a break from um, berating and abusing his wife and had changed to neglecting her completely instead, uh, which I agree, Carrie, is is better. But as I said before the break, it's here that we're going to see the first homicide from <laughs> Dr. Dale Cavaness. Although his sons are still safe for at least six more years. On Thursday, April 8th, 1971, Dale was driving from Harrisburg on Route 34, heading for his farm in Galatia, down in Egypt. He was in a friend's borrowed El Camino, with, as always, an open bottle of scotch next to him on the passenger seat. Dale tried to pass a Plymouth station wagon, but there was a pickup oncoming that swerved to avoid him, forced that truck onto the shoulder again. Dale dipped back behind the uh, station. He tries to pass the wagon again. No oncoming traffic this time, but Dr. Cav- Dr. Cavaness somehow finds a way to hit the station wagon's left rear fender as he's trying to pass it. Mm-hmm. He's drunk. The El Camino goes careening over the divider oh. into the oncoming lane. Oh, God. And hits a car driven by Donald Ray McClaskey. His wife and 10-month-old daughter were in the car. Mm. Donald and 10-month-old Deidre were both killed instantly. Now, I I have like the whole mad men sort of thing in my head of people just drinking with like an, an open tumbler of scotch sure. in their hand. Was Were there like laws at this time against drinking and driving? Yes, there sure were. Okay. I never know, because it seemed like, oh, you're just not having your seatbelt, you're just having a nice scotch on the rocks. The impression I get from a madman is that... and even get even, in trouble for it? Yeah, even Chappaquiddick, right? I think that yeah. officers were a little less likely to enforce dr- drunk driving laws, but if you were drunk and got involved in an accident... It's pertinent. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of which, Dale at this time had a 0.24 oh my God. BAC, and that is with two hours to sober up since he kept refusing to take a blood test until they told him there was a double homicide involved. And point, what, 08 is drunk? 0.08 is over the legal limit, yes. So this is three <laughs> times. Jesus. Sloshed. Yeah, uh, they say 0.3 is a potentially fatal BAC, so... I wish it I wish it had been he, Sean. He was definitely in slurring, stumbling, blackout territory. Mm-hmm. Sitting at the crash site, someone came up and asked Dale if he was okay. Uh and and said there were two people dead over there. Uh, there are two people dead. Are you okay? And he said, I'm fine, I have insurance. Oh, callous. And when he refused to take a blood alcohol test and was told two people were dead. He said something along the lines of like, well, everybody's got to die sometime. Like this is in the hospital on the night it happened. You killed them, dude. You didn't have to do that. Correct. Sicko. Uh, He was also cited for a loaded shotgun and pistol that were both in his car with the safeties off. Great. Uh, For all this, Dale- You never know when you'll see a beautiful owl. (laughs) Uh, Dale uh, pled not guilty to this, of course. Um- Fought it in court, but ultimately was sentenced to two years of probation and a $1,000 fine. For what, manslaughter? Double reckless homicide. Reckless homicide. (sighs) It was double reckless homicide. And he just went back to work after this? Yeah. (laughs) In fact, the fact that he was a practicing doctor was seen as reason not to send him to jail because his community would be uh, losing the benefit of his service. Yeah, if he's not actively killing them. Yeah, there is that. Now let's talk about the boys. Because over the next six years, Mark Dale Cavaness had a very hard time. The eldest son. Uh, It won't surprise you to know that he was affected by growing up in such a... Sick. Depraved. Raucous environment. (laughs) Raucous is a word. Um, Mark had struggled in school and ultimately dropped out of high school. Uh, he was, by all by accounts of all of his friends, a heavy drinker, um, occasional weed smoker. Um, to his father, he was a no-good pot smoker who would never amount to anything. And apparently Dale never missed a chance to say that. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Marion said at this point, her phone conversations with John were mostly sarcastic complaints about Mark. Oh, when I say John, I mean Dale. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, By the way, Marion also says that Dale once told her after he had a fight with Sean, I don't care if I go to jail, I'll kill him. Great. Which is a thing lots of parents say about their kids. Most of them don't later follow through. Mm -hmm. In 1977, Mark Dale Cavaness was 22 years old. Oh, here it comes. He was doing odd jobs around town and working on his dad's farm. Marion, his mother, says she thought around that time she should move him to St. Louis. Help him get uh, help for his depression and for substance abuse and try to get him a job. Um, she thought, he's not dumb, he can get his GED and we can um, we can straighten him out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the plans were starting to happen for that. Mark invited his mom and two of his brothers to Little Egypt for the Easter holiday. Sean and uh, Kevin, who were 15 and 19 at the time. Yeah, forget the little one. We don't care about Patrick. <laughs> I don't think he was there. I know he wasn't searching the field when they when they found Mark. Mm. Spoilers. Marion and the boys arrived on Friday. Good Friday. It wasn't a good Friday for them because they did not find her son there. I'm, I'm sorry. No, they showed up on maybe late Thursday night even mm-hmm. and thought that Mark would be there to greet them. But he wasn't. And then he didn't show up Friday. And Dale was like, he's probably out with his no good friends. And then on Saturday, they were sitting around going, where the hell is Mark? Mm -hmm. And it was around this time that Dale, weirdly, staring into his cup of coffee, said, I don't know, I've got a funny feeling about him. I think he's dead. Mm. Marion and uh, two of the boys headed out to the uh, check one of the farms. They could... <laughs> well, on that comforting note, let's, uh, let's well, take it, a walk. It sounds like that kind of prompted them to go, well, let's go look for him. I don't want that thought in my head, you know? Yeah. Um, so one of the farms was called the Shea House by the family. They had multiple farms, but they went to the Shea House and uh, found Mark's pickup truck there. Dale did not come with them. He said he had a few things to take care of in town and he would try to meet up with them later. He just said he thought his son was dead. You, you, you go ahead. I'll meet up with you later. Um, it was Sean, 15 years old, who found his brother's body lying on his back about 10 to 12 feet from the truck. Mark's flesh had been all but completely stripped from his skull Ugh. with just one eyeball and his hair left. Oh, my God. Uh, his upper torso, similarly, was basically skeletonized. With only little scraps of flesh. Like he was cut this way? He was eaten. By what? Animals. So he had been there for a while. Less than 24 hours. Um, definitely less than 48 hours. But they said, they said in this part of, like, it's rural Illinois and just... Turkey vultures will get at him. Wolves and coyotes oh will God. get at him. And so, yeah, within like two days, a, a, a body will be stripped. So could they not figure out how he died? Oh, we'll get to that in a second. His okay. lower body was basically intact because it was clad in blue jeans and heavy work boots. So the animals couldn't get to it. Mm-hmm. It was Sean who found Mark and he identified his brother immediately by his belt buckle. The ME made that official later with dental work. God. Um, so like I said, animals made pretty quick work, obviously, of the crime scene. Uh, and then the family further contaminated the crime scene as they were kind of stumbling around going, oh, no, you know. Yeah. It was impossible to tell for investigators where Mark had been standing when he was killed because the animals had moved him while they were eating his whole body, basically. Oh, my God. Um, robbery was ruled out because the wallet was found near the body and his shirt was also found some distance away. There was a two and a half by four inch hole between his left breast pocket and the buttons of the shirt uh, that was, police said, pretty clearly created by a 12 gauge shotgun loaded with buckshot. Mm -hmm. The truck, meanwhile, was a bloody mess with blood all over the driver's seat, floorboards and driver's door panel. So did they think he was shot in the truck? Well, the shotgun was on the floorboard of the truck. Um, sticking out of its case slightly by the barrel. Now listen to this. There was a coat hanger 
attached to the trigger of the gun by its hook. With a vest hanging partly off the hanger, that vest was closed in the driver's side door of the truck. Okay. Now, to Kevin, this looked like someone had fashioned a booby trap. That was the first thing he thought. Interesting. Open door, gun go boom. Yeah, okay. Did did they think it was possibly suicide? Uh, suicide was not seriously considered because shooting yourself in the chest with a shotgun um, would be a really bad way to commit suicide. Sure, but I mean, people have cut their own throats. That's not great. Right. No, that's true. Uh, the conclusion of the police investigators on the scene was that Mark had grabbed the gun by the barrel trying to pick it up. While he was pulling it out of the case, the coat hanger pulled the trigger and he took a point blank blast to the chest just trying to pick the gun up out of the truck. My God. Kevin also says, by the way, his brother knew guns very, very well, having grown up around them his whole life. Uh, Dale had a really big gun collection. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would never have grabbed one by the barrel. No, you never point one. Even if the safety's on, you don't point it at yourself. Unloaded safety on. You don't point it at anyone. No. Um, the investigating detective, Jack Nolan, uh, agreed with Kevin on that. And he also said... If the gun was fired in the case, the shell from the Browning automatic should have stayed in the case. That's where it would have been ejected. Mm -hmm. Instead, the shell was on the floorboards of the truck. Hmm. And Nolan also pointed to the $40,000 insurance policy that had been just been taken out that had just been taken out on Mark by none other than his father, Dr. John Dale Cavaness. Oh, how convenient. In February, he had he had taken out this policy. So this gun nut had taken an insurance policy out, had already killed two people drunk driving. Case closed. This guy Nolan thought so, but he knew he didn't have any physical evidence tying Dale to the crime at all. And he also knew this guy was basically like a, a local hero pillar of the community. I mean, literally, he says he knew he couldn't, he would have no chance getting Dale Cavaness on murder of his son unless he had like ab actual absolute airtight case so he like shadowed him and his connections for weeks uh, he was like running a lead down about Dale possibly stealing morphine from the hospital and selling it um, he did everything but after like weeks or months of this uh, he gave up the ghost and had to move on to different cases there just wasn't the evidence there to connect Dale to the scene so no fingerprints or I mean there's not DNA at this time but right. <sighs> wow. Similar to his older brother, Sean Cavaness struggled with alcohol and drugs. Um, you would think he might, you could say he had double the reason to, since he had found his older brother. Um, partially eaten body. Shot and partially eaten, yes. Oh my God. Um, so Sean seemed like he was starting to go down the same path, maybe. Uh, he was already out of high school, um, but... Not when, not when he was 15, obviously. Um, after he, like, he did successfully graduate from high school, but then he started getting into alcohol and drugs. Um, I mean, I don't even think drugs too much. I think all the Cavaness boys are just drinkers. And by the way, the dad killed two people while drunk driving. And he his... can't look down on them at all. Like, he started this, literally. Oh, yeah. And he also, uh, his... Like, people who worked at the hospital said, A, his drinking was not even an open secret. It was just kind of a local legend. Uh, everyone knew he had, like, thermoses full of booze in his car. And Did he drink on the job? Yes. He had bottles in, like, every room of the hospital that he could get to. You know, I think it actually wouldn't be too much of a loss if he had gone to prison. <laughs> it's better than having a drunk doctor. I think you're right, but the, listen, the people loved him. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so Sean was uh, struggling with, with his drinking, and the family started to worry about him. He was starting to get listless. I think he had lost his job. Um, but his mom and his remaining siblings uh, urged him to seek treatment, and he ended up going to a 12-step program and like even an inpatient for like a month. And then Sean seemed to be doing better. He was living in St. Louis, and in late 1984, Sean had told his brother Kevin that he and Dale were actually getting pretty close. They were having, like, weekly calls almost. Dale would come and visit occasionally. Huh. Um, Kevin and his 
wife at that point, Charlie, uh, said they were a little bit worried about Sean spending more time with their with their dad. Yeah. Especially since Sean had also dropped out of community college, uh, and they were worried that his dad would just encourage him to drink again more. Is that so being inter- their, their dad <laughs> so being interesting. a drunk? You're a loser. Be a drunk like me. Like it's such weird reasoning. Well, drunks need drinking buddies. Yeah, but he sounds like he has plenty of bros. He definitely did. Um, Sean's only job that winter was shoveling snow for a landscaper, the only source of income. And while Dale was paying his rent, at the time of his death, all of Sean's utilities had been cut off because he hadn't paid the bills in months. Mm-hmm. It was December 13th, 1984, around 8 in the morning, when a farmer in the St. Louis area found Sean in a remote area near the city called Times Beach. It used to be called Times Beach uh, until it was abandoned by the EPA. The EPA ordered everyone to abandon it um, because it's just loaded with this poison called dioxin that like super causes cancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was later cleaned up as a super fun site and turned into a bird sanctuary. but at this time, I think it was just like a, a poison site. <laughs> a dump. Yeah. And that's where Sean Cavaness was found. By this farmer, lying on his back, arms parallel to his body, uh, near a ruined gate. He'd taken two shots to the back of the head from a three fifty seven Magnum. There was an apparent exit wound, the detective said, under his left eye. Hmm. He was identified by his fingerprints. He had uh, no serious criminal record, but a traffic stop back in 83 had taken his fingerprints down. And uh, so that's how he was identified. An officer said the body was still warm when he was found. So this 830 is within three hours of the time he died. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't yet been eaten. And he hadn't been eaten yet. Yeah. God. Remember, this isn't quite as rural. This is rural, mm-hmm. but we're near St. Louis, not down in uh, Egypt. Mm-hmm. Now, this is gross, but relevant. Okay. The bullet that came out under Sean's left eye started in the back of his head, just right of the center line, fired from less than an inch away, but not actually touching the skin because there was no contact burn. Mm-hmm. The blood spatter suggested Sean was standing with his left arm slightly raised when that shot was taken. Mm -hmm. It's pretty remarkable how they can figure this stuff out. It is amazing. Yeah. The second shot was from 12 to 18 inches away, about a foot, foot and a half, as Sean lay on the ground, so execution style. And that one entered near his right ear and lodged in the brain because it couldn't pass all the way through and come Mm -hmm. out. The autopsy revealed Sean had had more than a dozen drinks that night. So he was off the wagon. And the execution-style wound pattern and the lack of wallet immediately suggested robbery. Or maybe someone had learned their lesson the last time and not left the wallet. Maybe someone had, but you know when the police asked Dr. Dale, he said he hadn't seen his son Sean in several weeks. Hmm. And like one, actually, before they even talked to him, they had already talked to an eyewitness who had seen him at Sean's apartment the night before he died. How you can explain that one, Dale? Like an old couple had seen the, a car cruising the apartment. They thought it was driving really suspicious, like slowly cruising <laughs> the apartment. They wrote down the plate number. Just made it obvious. And then when he came out and went upstairs, they were like, oh, it's it's our neighbor's dad. It's fine. And they didn't think about it anymore. But they said later on, uh, around 3 a.m., they heard two sets of footsteps leaving the apartment. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the evening of December 14th, right after his son's death, he attended a Christmas party where he was seen drinking and laughing as normal, as he normally would. Um, Now, Dale hadn't been told about Sean at this point at the party. Oh, I see. But his behavior at the Christmas party will become suspicious in a second. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we know he saw Sean before he died. Mm -hmm. So when police confronted him with that lie, John changed his story. He said, oh no, you know what happened? Uh, He said that he and Sean were drinking together. They had gone for a ride and stopped at the bird sanctuary because it was pretty. (laughs) Sean had asked to see Dale's gun. And Dale had handed it to him. And then Sean held the pistol to the back of his head and said, tell mom I'm sorry. And put a bullet through his own eye. So slightly different. 
And who doesn't commit suicide by holding a gun to the back of their own head? With their other hand slightly raised. No one's ever done it. So how about the second bullet? Obviously, he shot himself twice. No. Duh, that's what people do. That would be ridiculous, Caroline. (laughs) Kavaness says what happened then was he staged the robbery scene because he thought a suicide would just kill his ex-wife, Marion. And he couldn't see her go through that kind of pain. So he added an extra gunshot. (sighs) What a good guy he is. And he stole... And he shot. <laughs> he shot his son a second time, and he stole his wallet and watch to make sure Marion would be okay. Yeah, because he's very, very concerned about her well-being. His human punching bag. He said he had taken the the shot that exited Sean's eye. But that's the first shot. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's another hole in his story. Police were like, "Wait, you said which shot, sir? And he, are you sure?" And he was like, "Yes. Oh no, it didn't. It came out." How um, would he know if he was already lying on the ground, too? Stupid. Ugh. It's all stupid. You're a doctor. So Get he, it together. He claimed the wrong gunshot was self-inflicted. And police said, not only did you not know which bullet had, you know, um, they said there was no way Sean had shot himself uh, with his left hand, with a gun behind his head, with a .26 BAC, which is a apparently trend with this family. And also, he, it wasn't against his skin. Like, maybe if you're doing this with your funky hand, and I don't know if he was right or left-handed, um, maybe you hold it against your head to, like, kind of hold it there, you know? You, you, I don't, I can't imagine being able to do that and holding it away from my head. I can't imagine being able to do that at all, but right. it's just dumb. I think you'd have to pull the... Th- I, I would assume you would pull the thumb with your the trigger with your thumb and hold the back of the gun with your other four fingers. Yes. But it's so precarious. And we're talking about a guy who's had like sixteen beers. Absolutely not. He would have he would have blown like the top of his skull off or something and or survived. Like his ear off. Um so it would have slipped because it wasn't against anything. Needless to say, Carrie. Oh, and by the way, the detective who was investigating this in St. Louis eventually talked to Detective Nolan from Egypt, and Nolan was like, oh, yeah, this guy ki- totally killed his other kid. <laughs> we couldn't prove it. Um, so, you know, it was pretty much pretty open and shut on this one. Um, and we went right into, and they went right into trial the year after. Um, appalled citizens, meanwhile, <laughs> got a fund together for the good doctor's defense. Stop. They raised $38,000 in 1985 How about money. you hire a new doctor with that money? How about you do that? Instead of your old drunk asshole doctor who killed two people before and probably his son. I, 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 uh, I hate it. It's wild. During the trial, Kevin told the court that uh, Dale had admitted to him the same drug dealing that that cop was trying to... Um, nail him on he before. did the morphine he said he kevin said that dale told him that he had done the morphine and said if you tell anyone i'll kill you <laughs> with like not not with that like wink that every dad says that you know but no. with an actual like no really i'm gonna no, kill. the way dale would say this you know i've killed two of your brothers i really will murder you um and so in january of 1986 john dale Cavaness was convicted of first degree murder and under the laws of the state of illinois he was sentenced to death Good. Bye. He wouldn't make it to the electric chair. <sighs> because on November 17th, 1986, Dr. John Dale Cavaness hanged himself with an electrical cord. I knew he would. In his jail cell. I knew he would. His suicide. he's a coward. Not, that, not saying that suicide is a cowardly act, but I knew he wouldn't make it. Well, because... That would be someone else's plans for him coming yes, to fruition. Yes, he had to be in charge. Always. To the end. To the end. And so, um, just a few more, few posthumous notes about, about Dale. His suicide note began, I want, to, I want to make it clear that this final act has nothing to do with my care or treatment while confined to this institution. He went on to praise the work of the prison staff <laughs> while making no mention at all of any of his sons at any point in the suicide note. He's always good to uh, to the people on the outside, not to the people who are closest to him. He wants everyone else to think he's God. 
When Dale's will was read, Martha Cully, his main bang buddy from all those years ago, was listed as the sole beneficiary. (sighs) And as for insurance, it turned out that he had changed the beneficiary on his $198,000 life insurance policy to Martha also, after he was convicted. Cool. There was a clause about suicide in that life insurance policy, but it expired the day before Dale killed himself, which I'm sure he knew. So one last little bit of uh, working the insurance system, and Dr. Dale Cavaness was out of, our, out of our hair forever. Good riddance. So what do you think of that story? I am mad. I am a mad, mad girl about it. It's just ultimate privilege, toxic masculinity. It's, honestly, it's a nightmare. It's my nightmare of, like marrying someone and them being a total monster and them just just doing all these monstrous acts to the people that they should be caring for. I mean, it's it's a nightmare. I'm glad that Marion didn't get killed, but that didn't help the sons much. Um, she, she specifically blamed herself for Sean's death for the rest of her life because she had um, gone and married. She got remarried, you know what I mean? Which involved moving away. And yeah. so she wasn't there. It's, when he was murdered. It's not her fault. No, of course, of course it is. She isn't. was the only person that was trying to, to help. And it's just so tragic. <sighs> I hate it. So there you have it. John Dale Cavaness. If well, you, you know what? I'm glad he's dead. How about that? I'm certainly glad <laughs> he's dead. That's a happy dead. ending. I think an electrical cord is probably one of the less comfortable things to hang yourself with. <laughs> so there's that. Probably a little chafe on the way down. Hmm. And uh, I really liked this book, by the way. If you want to know more about this uh, story, this case, uh, Murder in Little Egypt by Darcy O'Brien is uh, really good. And I think I will pick up that Hillside Stranglers book from him uh, so we can cover that story. Uh, Because, Carrie, if you don't know the story of uh, Angelo Buono and (laughs) Kenneth Bianchi. Just a couple of Italian boys on the town. Yeah, just out for a good time, you know? (laughs) Just out for a good time. Not for a long time. You're here, which means you love podcasts, but are you looking for another kind of entertainment on the go? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to memoirs, news, business, and more. By signing up for a free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary, you'll receive access to thousands of titles with one credit toward any audiobook and two Audible originals, free during your trial and then with subscription each month after. Personally, my favorite Audible title is also my favorite book, It by Stephen King. I went into this audiobook ready to judge because I've loved this novel since I was a kid. But between the stellar production value and the truly breathtaking narration performance by actor Steven Weber, I was 100% all in. If you like this podcast and have a strong stomach, I think you will be too. Not into audiobooks? No problem. With podcasts, theatrical performances, guided meditations, and more, Audible offers something for everyone. So what are you waiting for? Get started now. And hey, you'll be helping support the podcast. Visit our link at www.audibletrial.com slash ain't it scary for a free trial. That's www.audibletrial.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Audible. Listen more. Let's take a break from true crime with our new segment of new segment in honor of spooky season, Halloween horrors. In Berea, Ohio, the frights became all too real for one family after one t- one of the haunt actors at Seven Floors of Hell haunted house got a little too overzealous with a prop knife. Seven Floors of Hell is this isn't this what David Pumpkins appears on? <laughs> I think that was like a hundred floors. <laughs> at about 8.15 p.m. last Saturday, police were called to the attraction at the Cuyahoga County Fairgrounds to respond to reports of a foot stabbing. A foot stabbing? <laughs> yeah. You remember that time I stepped on a knife in our, uh, a cheese knife? Yes, that Poe had knocked onto the ground, yeah. 
I've still got cheese in my foot. Stop. Ew. One of the actors, identified as Christopher Pogolzelski, was roaming on the outside of the attraction using a large Bowie knife as a prop, scraping at the ground with it. You'll see this at haunts. They've got, they're oh. always scraping around. And they making sparks with them. Yes. Some people have... Stuff on their shoes. Yes. Yeah. Well, apparently the knife was real because when Pogazelski began to stab at the ground in front of an 11-year-old boy that was attending with his family, he accidentally stabbed it into the child's croc shoe and into his left foot. Oh, yeah. That croc is not... I don't <laughs> think those are steel toe. Absolutely not. Mine have uh, fuzzies in them, and that's like high... So that's a little more protective than technology. this little boy. Yes. Karen Bednarski, mother of the child in question, told ABC News 5 Cleveland that, quote, He walked up to my son and he was holding the knife and his intentions were to scare him. But my son responded to him by saying, That's fake. I'm not scared. That's when he began to stab at the ground, but cut it a little too close, literally, and sliced the side of the boy's big toe. That's what the mom said? No. Oh, I was like, I, I, she's very cool about this to be making puns and stuff. No, she, I'm not scared. That's when he began to stab at the ground and then cut the toe. Apparently, the attraction didn't do much to help smooth things over, and Bignarski stated, They just kept saying accidents happen, accidents happen. They told me that they were not certified to administer first aid. Oh! <laughs> Maybe this will... Because when they say oh, accidents happen, it sounds like they're trying to convince you, like, there's no liability issue here. Yes. It's okay. Uh, we... No, we're not going to... We can't perform first aid. Are you it's crazy? It's a county fairground. There should be a doctor around. I'm going to go out on a limb. There should be a doctor around like any time you're doing anything. any group of people are <laughs> yeah. somewhere. Eventually, they did apply first aid to the toe and confiscated the knife from the haunt actor who told police he had brought the all too real prop from home. Oh, guy. Rodney Geffert, the president of Night Scream Entertainment, which owns Seven Floors of Hell, said it was just an accident. Quote, I guess he got a little too close. It was a complete accident and poked the boy's toe. The police took the knife and I made it real clear with him. You don't go to your vehicle and just get something out like that. We just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rodney. So weird that you had had to tell him that, though. Lieutenant Tom Walker with the Berea Police Department confirmed to News 5 that Pogazelski has been charged, saying, quote, I can't explain why he brought the real knife. He could have been, he should have been using a fake prop or rubber knife. Yes. <laughs> yes, I would say so. Obviously a poor decision on his part to bring a real knife to the fairgrounds, and he's been criminally charged with neg negligent assault as a result of making that decision. Negligent assault can't carry that stiff a penalty, right? I accidentally assaulted someone? Yeah. Uh, Rodney Geffert, for his part, said he will have to make a decision about whether to keep Christopher Pogazelski employed at the Seven Floors of Hell. Hasn't fired him yet, it seems. I was good. Well, look, if he hasn't fired, if he's not telling the press that he fired him, I think that guy's job is safe, honestly. Wild. Absolutely wild. Look, he poked it. Y'all, watch your feet out there. This is a crazy season. <laughs> Just watch your feet. Carrie, give me your hand. I want to poke it. No. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. We certainly will be forever grateful. And we already are to our beloved top-tier patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thank you, guys. We love you all. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan, and you can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Wow.